hold on, hold on. Judge is in session. What is the problem here? He put my stuff in jello again. <laughs> How do you know it was me? Jim is my enemy. But it turns out that Jim is also his own worst enemy. And the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Jim is actually my friend. But because he is his own worst enemy, the enemy of my friend is my enemy. So actually, Jim is my enemy. But. Oh, I love Dwight. Any, anybody just big fan of Dwight? Oh my gosh, so awesome. Um, classic, yes. So um, my name is Lacey. I serve on the team here. So glad that you are a part of Rock Hills Church today and a part of our finale and family feud. Um, excited to get to share with you today. Uh, but before we jump into the talk, just want to welcome those of you watching online. Uh, we know that many of you are in different cities or states, either, um, even already traveling for Thanksgiving holiday, but maybe catching us online today on the interwebs. Um, and then some of you, man, are some of our servicemen and servicewomen serving overseas, and we just want you to know how proud we are of you and, and so thankful you're watching online. And then there's a family, the Jeffries. A big shout out to you guys hosting church in your home in Germany. Uh, they they said, man, that there's not an English-speaking church uh, within an hour drive, or I think an hour and 20 minutes, um, of their home. And so they said, why don't we just host Rock Hills Church online in our living room? And that's what they're doing. And so everybody, would you just welcome our our online church family. And then you guys are in the room, and you are looking fine today, all right? So, I mean, you don't have to worry about any extra calories this week. I mean, you, you just, you look so good. You just enjoy Thanksgiving, all right? Um, but we, we are so glad you chose to uh, just make Rock Hills a part of your Sunday. And I believe that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, that Jesus wants to speak to you Today And so in Family Feud, the last couple weeks, our first week, we talked about how we all are aiming for something, and ultimately we're all hitting something, but are we aiming for and hitting the right target when it comes to our families, when it comes to our relationships? And so that was week one, and then last week, man, Troy talked about just the, the four essentials for a family of how in family and in families, we, we've got to be um, learning how to handle conflict, learning how to handle loss. We've got to figure out how to embrace grace, right? I mean, it was powerful. So I encourage you, if you missed last week or the week before, man, go online, go to our website, go to Facebook, whatever works for you. But I think it'll be a help for you in your journey as you figure out what, what are my relationships when I'm a follower of Jesus, what does this look like? And, and I know that some of you today... I mean, you are here and you are just kicking the tires of faith. I mean, you, you are just trying to figure out, is Jesus really who he said he is? And I am so glad that you're here because this is a safe place. We really hope that it's a refuge for people to be able to come in, go on a journey, ask questions. God's not afraid of your questions and we aren't either. But this is a place that you can explore if Jesus is who he said he is. And so today, what we're going to talk about these different principles, man, I think that it's something to for you to consider something there's some principles that are practical that I think even as you do them um, could really impact your life and the relationships around you but then I know that many of us man we say we said yes to Jesus we uh, we are followers of Jesus and so what we're going to talk about today when it comes to communication everybody communication I know I heard somebody groan like oh a thug in the me right? Communication when as followers of Jesus, what does that pattern look like for us? And so we're, we're going to talk about that today. And so I know some of you, you're like, darn it, the one time I come to church, they're talking about family feud. I don't have kids or I'm not married or I'm single or I'm single again and, or I'm a teenager or I'm a, a young adult, Wh whatever that might be. L let me just prove it to you that I believe today is going to be for you. Go ahead and check if you have a belly button. All right? Lift up your shirt. You know, just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do Keep your shirts on. Um, and so, you know, if you have a belly button, then I believe that what God wants to speak to us today is for everybody. Because we all have connections. We all have disconnections. We, we all have family. We all have 
people in our lives that, that are a part of our everyday. There, there's, there's friends, there's family, right? And when it comes to communication, man, it plays a big part in our everyday life. And so if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. These are two just basic principles that I think will just give us a good foundation for the rest of our talk. So number one is this. Great relationships are possible, but they're not always probable, all right? Great relationships, are po- great relationships are possible, but not always probable. And then number two, great relationships don't happen by chance. They happen by choice. So that means we don't just like <laughs> fall into a great relationship, right? I mean, that'd be handy. But we, great relationships, at least all the ones that I've seen and I've been a part of, man, they come because we've made the choice. We've made the choice to have a great relationship. And so today as we talk about communication, our world is full of communication. What I'm about to tell you is going to make some of you a little sick to your stomach, so just buckle up. There are every day 200... 93.6 billion emails sent every day. Is that not ridiculous? Like, that is insane. Now, only a third are actually read. (laughs) Anybody not read your email? Yes, confession's good for the soul. It's good. Um, There are 350 million posts on Facebook every day. There are 95 million plus. They, They haven't like exactly figured it out, but they know 95 million at least post on Instagram every day. And then on average, the average person, so depending on your personality, you could be a little bit more or less, but the average person speaks 7,000 words every day. Now, one husband I heard recently, he said, I haven't talked to my wife in weeks. I didn't want to interrupt her. That is awesome, isn't it? Um, unless, unless you're that wife, and then that's kind of a bummer. But, uh, but I love that. So communication is king, isn't it? In all of our relationships, all of the good things that happen and the joy that we celebrate, man, often we celebrate that in communication, right? But then, man, some of the hardest moments we've been through, I mean, some of you, you carry deep wounds when it comes to communication, some of the hardest things in your life, maybe even when you were a child, that you still carry those deep wounds today because words are powerful, because communication really is king. We've got to learn how to communicate. George Bernard Shaw said this. I thought this was interesting. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion it has taken place. Communication is challenging. Now, I've, I've got to tell you, One of the things that is like a major pet peeve of mine when it comes to social media, I mean, we can all communicate at our fingertips, right? All day, every day, we all can, and we all probably are with those statistics, right? But one of my biggest pet peeves, and when I um, kind of live up to the stereotype of an Irish angry redhead, (laughs) is when I see Christians that profess to love Jesus, and they are commenting and saying all of these just mean things. Like, it drives me crazy. Like, honestly, I shift from like an angry, you know, Irish woman into the Hulk. And I just like everything within me, and then I just want to type back. And I just want to say, that is so wrong, in all caps, right? But then I realize, oh, if I do that, I'm doing the same thing that they're doing, right? And so I, I don't know about you, but something that just drives me crazy recently is when I have seen so many followers of Jesus saying bad things about Kanye West and his gospel album, Oh my gosh, I could not believe it that people were saying, well, I don't know if it's really, really real. Well, goodness, are we, the, are we now the judge? Man, now the gospel is being shared all over the world because someone has encountered Jesus. Like, it's amazing the things as followers of Jesus sometimes, sometimes we're the worst at it, that we begin to communicate things We haven't even asked, Jesus, is this really pleasing to you? And man, I'm in the boat 
with you, my friends, all right? And I promise I didn't see any of you post that, so you're like, oh my goodness, she saw my post. I didn't. I just saw other things, and it just, it really it just breaks my heart because I know we all have a communication, a failure to communicate sometimes, don't we? But God has something more. He has more for us. And the great thing about Jesus is that he has an uncommon life for you and for me. If you're a follower of Jesus, he has a life that is uncommon, but he has life and life to the full. Abundant life is what he tells us. And so anything that Jesus asks us to do, he always gives us the power to do it. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to do that, and then leave us alone to figure it out. No, he gives us the power to do it, and we see that in Philippians 2. God will continually, so this isn't like a one-time thing, every day, continually, God will revitalize you, implanting within you the passion to do what pleases him. He will give you the power. In Romans 12, 2, this is kind of our foundation verse for the rest of of our our talk today. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Because we know when we copy the world, we get, man, we get some pretty messed up things, don't we? Especially in relationships. And it's so easy. You know, you don't have to practice bad habits, They just naturally happen, don't they? And so God wants us to have an uncommon way of life. He says, don't copy the way of the world, but let God transform you and make you totally new into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. When we begin to allow God to transform us, because when he transforms our heart, then out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. So if we are in a transformation process, then transformation is going to be coming out. When we're inviting Jesus to work in us and through us, he will. And so don't copy the behaviors of this world. But let him change you. I love that. Now, behavioral researchers, they tell us there are four levels of communication. All right? Now, there's surface communication, if you're taking notes. And surface would be, you know, pretty surface. Like, hey, how you doing? How are you? And you actually don't care how the other person is. You just say it because it's like filler words. Because you don't actually have time to have a conversation with somebody. And anybody have that, right? You just, hey, how you doing? Hey, take care, you know? And, and there's nothing wrong with it, but we're not going to have great relationships. We're not going to have great marriages. We're not going to have great relationships with our coworkers or, or our kids if we stay on that surface level. So then that next level of communication is general. Now, man, I know a lot of couples, and I know Troy and I, man, we, we have got stuck in the general information cycle. And this is what that looks like. Like, okay, what meetings do you have today? And who's picking up the kids? And, and what, what's happening? When are we leaving for Thanksgiving? And what time are we leaving for Christmas? And, you know, it's details, and those are good. I mean, there, there's nothing bad about that. But, man, if we get into the cycle in our relationships of just general information, Man, we are missing out on what God has for us. So this next um, level of (laughs) communication, I'm going to give all of you men just like you are going to hug me afterwards because this is going to revolutionize your marriage. You're going to be so excited, okay? So if, if you just say these four words, they are the most romantic words every wife would like to hear from you to get to the next level of communication, and they are this. And then what happened? Okay, if you just, your wife is telling you a story or she's telling you how you feel, man, if you just slip in those four little words, I am telling you, it is gold, my friends, okay? And then what happens? So number three, that will lead you into deep feelings. Now, this isn't like, let's all get around in a circle and sing kumbaya, you know? Um, This isn't silly. Deep feelings, we all have got to have a place where we can actually be real where we can share what is going on in our heart. That's why we talk about small groups all the time, why that's so important. Man, you've got to be in in community where you can be real with people and share. That's why we talk about this is a safe place because we realize we've got to have this level of communication where we can share our deepest needs. 
Number four, that fourth level is deep needs. So deep feelings and then deep needs. And man, I'm telling you, as if, if you're married especially, man, you've got to get to this level of communication. And I promise you the best way there, according to scripture, is mutual submission. Mutual submission. That's the best for your friendships. It's the best for your dating relationships. It's the best for your marriage. And what that means is that for me and Troy, that means I'm going to put his needs, his desires, his dreams, his goals above my own. But at the very same time, because it's mutual submission, at the very same, same time, Troy is saying, hey, Lacey, what are your needs, your dreams, your desires, your goals? And I'm putting them above my own. And as we do that, man, there is power when we're able to get to those levels of communication. But we all know there are some barriers to communication. This first one is withdrawal. This is when we play the game, the silent treatment game. <laughs> this is when we physically withdraw, we, we go in. You know, I'm sure you guys are so much holier than us, but when Troy and I play this game, um, I will get, we have a queen bed, and I will get to the very, like, the edge without just falling off the bed. Like, I don't want any part of my body to accidentally touch him because then I lose the game. Because if my, you know, like big toe accidentally scrapes against his, you know, calf or something, I mean, it's just over. And then we're going to have to talk about it. Okay, by your laughter, I know I'm not alone. So, right, like we withdraw. We do that in relationships. Sometimes, as followers of Jesus, we do that in church community, don't we? Some, something doesn't fit right. And then we decide, you know what? I'm going to withdraw from community instead of leaning in. Man, withdrawal is a barrier. The next barrier to communication is escalation. Escalation. This is when we really kind of lose our, our, lo our logic <laughs> and rational thought. We're yelling. Our temper is in control. We are no longer in control it doesn't help anybody. We may have won the moment because the other person is silenced, but we haven't encouraged a, you know, those levels of communication, of sharing our deep needs, sharing our deep feelings. We escalate. This third one, this third barrier, man, it's belittling. Belittling. And this is tough. You know, when we belittle others, what we're doing is we're saying, you know what, I'm not going to raise my level of maturity, so I'm going to attack someone else's self-esteem. And man, we can all be guilty of that, can't we? But so often when it comes to belittling, it's not that those people, some of them are just against you, but they just there's something broken in them that's causing them to attack you. But it's something that, that is broken on the inside for them, and they, they need to get help. You know, hurt people hurt people, right? I, I know my mom, you know, growing up, so my parents are uh, ministers. They've been pastors my whole life, been in ministry over 40 years. They're, they're amazing, and uh, you get to meet them throughout the year when you're part of Rock Hills because they'll come and speak every now and then, and, and um, I'm just so grateful. Um, but in ministry, because we serve people and hurt people hurt people, sometimes over the years growing up, I saw some really ugly things. You know, sometimes, you know, I think Troy said it last week, that the ugliest thing in the world is when the church gets it wrong. And I saw some of those moments. But then the most beautiful thing in the world is when the church gets it right, right? But in those moments where I saw my parents going through just some really harsh things that didn't make sense, and I couldn't believe that people who love Jesus said the things that they did and did the things that they did, it was hard to reconcile. Until I remember, man, I broke in two. <laughs> I'm not perfect. But she would tell me this, and, and I think it's worthwhile to remember. She said, Lacey, it's not that people are against you or against us. It's that people are for themselves, aren't we? Because we begin to have these blinders on, and because of the hurts and the habits, the hang-ups that we've experienced, we begin to treat other people. And especially if we don't resolve some of that conflict from those past relationships or another church or whatever it might be, and we bring that, that, all of that baggage into this new relationship, and we take something out on somebody that hasn't really done anything wrong. That's, that's belittling. Another barrier uh, is false belief, false belief. Man, this is when we just believe lies, that so many lies have, have happened in our mind that it becomes real to us. It becomes our reality. Now, when I think in, you know, in Scripture, it says that the enemy of our souls is the father of lies. Now, when I think about that phrase, I can't help but think about Buddy the Elf. 
when he says, you sit on a throne of lies. You smell like beef and cheese, right? I mean, it's so funny. But when we fall into this barrier of communication, and when we begin to think all of the, the lies, and we, we begin to apply those to our life as truth, man, man, it's not funny anymore, is it? It's heavy. But Jesus has come to not allow the enemy to still kill and destroy. He wants to bring life and life to the full. Matthew 12, 36. This is a tough one to read. This is Jesus speaking, okay? He says, let me tell you something. Every one of these careless words is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are powerful. Take them seriously. Words can, can be your salvation, but words can also be your damnation. Man, words are powerful. Do you know that in the, the third verse of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the third verse, everything is void. There's nothing. It's chaos. But then God speaks and he creates something out of nothing, good out of nothing. And God, his voice is speaking to you today. And I believe that the words that have been, you've been carrying that maybe have been heavy, the wounds that have determined how you have acted out your purpose, the things that you've allowed to define you, man, God is speaking into you today and he's saying that that's not who you are. Those words may have been spoken, but that's not who I say you are. You are my child. I have a great purpose and a plan for your life. What we have done doesn't define us. We can allow the one who designed us to define us. So, in our next few minutes, instead of focusing on all of the things that we shouldn't do, because I have a feeling we all know what we shouldn't do, right? Um, because we say things and we're like, oh, bummer, I should have thought before I spoke, you know? Like, like we, all, we all know probably what we shouldn't do. But I think that God wants us to focus today on what can we do. Because the words that we say create environments around us. So if we are constantly speaking in a negative cycle, man, our life is going to be in this negative spin cycle, isn't it? But if the words coming out of our mouth are going to be positive and uplifting, it's amazing how that is going to impact not only your own soul, but the people around you. But when hard moments come, when those, con those communication styles, that, those barriers come up that aren't fun and are challenging, here is just something that I, I encourage you to do. PSA, it's a public service announcement, but it actually um, serves as an acronym. If we all pause, we just take a breath in those moments. Just pause, then surrender. And we surrender to Jesus. That Again, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you say, you know what, Jesus, I'm laying down my rights God, would you help me to forgive? Would you help me to hold my tongue? Would you help me to say the right thing, to have the timing of when it needs to be said, right? We surrender to him. And then we act appropriately, <laughs> right? Because in, the, in those moments, then we determine, okay, we pause, we surrender, and then what is our next form of action? So when it comes to focusing on what we can do, we can PSA, right? But then I think there are two words that are really a bedrock for very four encouraging steps today. Those two words are be intentional. Be intentional. Because great relationships, again, they don't happen by chance. They happen by choice. So if we're going to be intentional, then we are choosing, you know what, instead of focusing on all the things I shouldn't do, I'm going to focus on these four things that I can do every day. So number one is this, encourage, encourage. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. What this means is that we should be speaking words that are timely, that are beautiful, and that are valuable looking for ways to encourage those who are discouraged, looking for ways to speak life into our coworkers, life into our spouse, life into our kids. You know, this is a big thing in our family. Every single day, or at least close to it, my goal is that the girls are going to know whether we're in the car or we're walking to school or it's before we've, we've left, and they're going to know, man, you are a leader. You're not a follower. 
Man, we are so proud of you. You got this today. Man, you are a great includer. You've got a great smile. Do you know that when you smile, it just makes me warm inside? Do you know that you are my favorite nine-year-old out of the whole world? You're my favorite. And did you know, Jade, my six-year-old, you are my favorite six-year-old out of the whole world? Do you know that when we just begin to speak those encouraging words, just like when you're encouraged, you know, when we do our hospitality dream team training, we talk about, hey, we try not to ask, hey, how are you at the front doors when you come in, but instead we try to say, hey, your hair looks awesome today. Man, I love those boots. Hey, great haircut. You know, whatever it might be, because we want this to be the most encouraging place you've been all week. And we can do that in our homes in our boardrooms, in our classrooms, wherever we go, we can be encouraging. Look for ways to encourage. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. Man, I think we all could say we've fallen short of that one, (laughs) right? But the pattern that God's calling us to is he's saying, but only say what's helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Words are not neutral. Words are either going to build up or they're going to bulldoze, right? And so, man, we want to use words that are encouraging. Proverbs 18 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. Man, let's speak life into our relationships. Number two is affection. Affection. And I want to read you a scripture in Jeremiah um, that I just think is so powerful. This is what God is telling you today. You just receive this from God. I have loved you. You tell whatever your name is. I have loved you, Lacey. I have loved you, Troy. I have loved you, Shelby. Whatever that name is. I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love. I have drawn you to myself. God is saying, I love you. I'm proud of you. I have a plan for your life. He's being affectionate. In our relationships, we've got to learn to be affectionate. We've got to learn to use those terms of endearment because words are powerful. And I know that some of us didn't grow up that way. I know that some of us that you you never heard a parent say, I love you, or or or, that wasn't a normal thing, that maybe it was a handshake or like a pat on the back and that communicated, hey, we love each other, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. But again, the whole uncommon, Jesus is very clear that he loves us and I think he calls us to be clear with those in our lives like I don't think anybody's ever been upset when someone told them how they felt that they loved them that they were valuable that they were so glad they were your kid or you were you were their parent I don't think people have been offended when 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 you try to connect right now I'm going to tell you when I was young I really struggled with hugging now, some of you are like, oh, my word, that's all you do now. Um, but uh, but in, in my childhood, so I came from a very affectionate, loving family and hands-on. There was lots of hugging, and, and um, my dad's hands are, like, ginormous, and they were always, like, on your face, and I love you, and it was awesome. But then, so I am naturally introverted. I know, again, shocker. And, and so I, I kind of got to this point where I was just overwhelmed, and, and I wanted to control something, and, and honestly, it had to do with fear, but we don't have time to unpack all that. And so um, I would do, I would do this when my family or anybody came in for a hug, you know, the, the classic stance for a hug, you know, you, you got your head up, your arms go out, you lean in, you know, well, for me <laughs> as a child and a young adult for a little while, um, I, uh, you know, somebody would come in for a hug and then I would do this. Whoop. <laughs> And so my family affectionately called those head hugs. Um, And so as soon as they would try to come in, I would just put my head down because I needed space, you know, that would guarantee me um, I wouldn't have to touch anybody's face and then likely no one would kiss me. So anyhow, so that's my own issue. I still, I'm 32 now, and every single holiday we get together, somebody brings up a head hug. Um, And one of my kids has actually done head hugs, um, so it's it's genetic. Um, But I'm telling you, affection, it's important. We've got to feel figure out how to show affection. And then number three, truth and love. Truth and love. John 1, 14, the word, meaning Jesus, he became flesh. He, he put skin on. He came to this world. He made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. 
Now, we've said this before, and I think it's worth stating again and again. Because in our culture, sometimes we get this confused. You see, truth without grace is mean. It's mean. Truth without, without grace is mean. But grace without truth is meaningless, right? But when we have truth and grace, man, it's medicine. That's why Jesus was full of grace and truth. And while we're not Jesus, as disciples, when we say yes to Jesus, we say yes to thinking, acting, and becoming more like him. Ephesians 4.15 says, We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Jesus. This is an opportunity for us to say, you know what? When I have a hurt, when there's an issue, when there's a conflict, I'm not going to go in with, you know, all the things that I've already in my mind argued about and I've heard the response and argued back. It's called sense making, you know, like we're the best lawyers in our brain, aren't we? You know, and so instead of that, I'm going to go into a situation and then I'm going to speak the truth in love. Because I'm, I'm not going to just spew truth, and I'm not just going to like let everything fall under the rug and sweep it under the rug, because then it'll just stew in my heart, and then it'll explode later, right? So we've got to say, say and do things in truth and in love. It's the same thing in church, man. I, I hope that if you have a relationship or a small group leader or a dream team leader, one of our pastors, man, that if there's ever a conflict that you would come in person and say, hey, help me understand what's going on. Because we'll always have a because to your why. We'll always have one. Now, we may have to agree to disagree. We may not see it eye to eye. But man, let's treat each other as humans, right? Not dehumanize people. And let's have truth and love. Let's be like Jesus. And then finally, and this is key. This is a huge step when it comes to healthy communication. I mean, we want to encourage each other daily. We want to show affection daily. We want to speak truth and love daily. But then I'm telling you, if you want to have healthy, meaningful relationships, we have got to be praying. We have got to be praying. In Philippians, it says this. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated, be covered, be immersed in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Then, it's a powerful word, then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts because our thoughts are connected to our heart, continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Paul, the apostle who was writing this as he's in prison, he's writing this because he knows out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the overflow of what we're thinking on, it's going to eventually come out. So if we're focused on what is good and pleasing and, and admirable, man, it's going to be amazing what comes out of our mouths. We've got to be saturated in prayer. And so what that looks like, man, it's praying first before we send that email. Before we go into that meeting, before the kids go to school, but before we eat, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities where we have just got to saturate our lives, our marriage, our relationships in prayer because prayer changes things. So whatever your step today, man, I encourage you, whether you're exploring the claims of Christ today or you're a longtime follower of Jesus, man, I encourage all of us to, to PSA to pause, surrender, take appropriate action, but then to figure out how can I just this week, even if you just make a goal for this week, how can I encourage somebody every day this week? How can I show affection to somebody? Is there somebody I need to give a call and just tell them, hey, I just want you to know I love you. I don't know if I've said it in a while. I just want you to know you're loved. And then maybe there's a situation that needs to have some truth spoken, and maybe you haven't included love in the past, so maybe there's some conversations you need to have and say, hey, you know what, would you, would you forgive me? And then start fresh again from this day forward where we're going to speak the truth in love. And then pray. Figure out how can you be saturated in prayer throughout your day. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that you spoke into each of us. 
thank you that your word is real and that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us, no matter our questions or doubts, no matter the situations we've been in or been through. God, you want to have, um, you want to give us life and life to the full. And Lord, right now in this moment, we take responsibility for the words we've said. God, we ask forgiveness for the things that we've said to others or even about ourselves or about other people. God, we ask forgiveness for that. We take ownership. We thank you for your forgiveness. And even as right now, as our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we just have this moment. If you're one of those people who's been exploring the claims of Christ, whether today's your first day or you've been coming for a while and you've yet to say yes to Jesus, then I encourage you today is the day. Today is the day of salvation for you to cross the line and say, you know what? I still have questions, but I'm gonna trust and believe that Jesus is the son of God who died on a cross, who rose from the dead and he wants a relationship with me. And all you have to do is just say yes to Jesus and then you are in the family and the best is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen.